Welcome to Epilogue Podcast, the show where we discuss some stuff that happened on a different show ages ago which nobody really cares about anymore. Hello, I'm Port Ponky. And I'm Oblock. Today we're discussing Deep Space Nine, Season 2, Episode 5, Cardassians. When a Cardassian war orphan arrives on Deep Space Nine, Garrick and Bashir try to investigate his origin whilst a custody battle for the child erupts. What were your thoughts? I like this episode a lot. Um, it's a pretty bold subject to go after. Uh, abandoned war orphans and what to do with them. And people using children for political gain. Not a lighthearted subject, and we're introduced to it with the lighthearted, plain and simple Garrick, and that's a nice uh, juxtaposition. What did you think of the episode? Well, it's a Garrick episode, so I had fun. I thought it was a little bit silly how uh, transparent the Cardassians were with the war orphans. <laughs> they like, honestly couldn't care less in a way that was kind of a bit silly to me. I can see that. Family is everything, but eh, orphans... Pfft. Except when it's not. Well, I mean, I guess they don't have families, but... <laughs> if you think a family was that important, then they would have a deep uh, warmth towards their fellow Cardassians in general. Yeah, of, uh, they would. There would be some sort of system to weave them into society, and not just leave them on the outskirts. You'd expect a very strong social structure, yet uh, across society, it doesn't seem to hold up because pretty much every Cardassian didn't care about war orphans at all. But other than that, I mean, that's just what slightly stood out. The episode was a lot of fun. Garrick's up to his tricks again. What parts uh, were the most fun for you? Oh, <laughs> I liked it. Oh, this is going to sound weird. When Bashir was uh, tossing and turning in his bed, and then Garrick just walks into his quarters. Apparently <laughs> he has access, and he's just looking at him. And Bashir wakes up, and Garrick says, It's time to go! It's so creepy and uh, weird. A little and bit very sexy. Garrick. Yeah. And then Bashir just says, yeah, okay. Doesn't call security of and course. say, oh my goodness, my cores have been invaded by a creepy Cardassian. And then we see Cisco in his uh, sleeping robes, uh, which apparently has a comm badge because someone boppity boops him. And then he answers. But I guess, I don't know how it works if the the room can just talk to you. Well, I guess it can because the computer does and ops. Yeah. So I guess he has surround sound computer in his bedroom. When he was in his robes, I was reminded of uh, Zap Brannigan saying, It's real velour. <laughs> he does have sexy robes. He's a very sensual person. Okay, I'm glad you didn't contest that in any way. Oh, yeah, that's that's uncontestable. Did you have any criticisms? Are we getting that to that already? Yeah, we could go into it. I guess there's no uh, specific order this has to go in. Um, nothing particular other than one really weird thing about this episode. Uh, when they decide that they should send Rugal, the kid, to live with someone else. They choose Keiko O'Brien, who's a little bit unhinged, and Miles O'Brien, who's openly racist towards Cardassians. <laughs> Which is finally addressed. Uh, Keiko calls him out on his blatant racism. Yeah, that was a very ugly thing you just said. That was a very good line. But then we get O'Brien to come around 
and say uh, you can't judge a whole race or whatever he said. Although that's a pretty <laughs> quick transformation. It didn't seem seen... very sincere. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't. You can't judge a whole race well. I mean, I do it all the time. And his example of uh, there's Kardashians you don't like and Kardashians you do, like you. Because he couldn't <laughs> think of any other one that he actually did like. I just met you, so I like you. Even though I know you bit a guy's hand. Unprovoked. Yeah, that still seems strange. Uh, it's a Bajoran self-defense tactic. <laughs> I wonder they were invaded. That's how they won. That's how they uh, overcame the Cardassians. Lots of hand biting. <laughs> Cardassians run out of gloves. Yep. No one thinks to protect the hand. Uh, don't bite the hand of feeds? Ah, I was just about to go into that. Bajorans discarded conventional wisdom and bit the hand that fed them. And it worked out. But they were feeding them bullets and slave labor. Not the best meal. Okay, this conversation is really... It fell apart a while ago. Let's get it back on track. Uh, Ducat, Gul Ducat, after appearing on Skype a lot of times, finally turned up on the station. Uh, Which was a bit weird. I expected him to be more imposing. First time since the premiere. Yeah, you expect him to be ten foot tall, don't you? Yeah, and then he's just a guy. <laughs> Which makes sense, but we we always see him on the on Skype and so we we build him up in our minds. Yeah, he's always shot from a low angle so he does look ten foot tall and then he turns up he's he's about five foot two or something. Yeah. Doesn't really work. He's still an imposing character. Yeah, maybe it does work. Maybe he has a Napoleonic complex. I've read that Napoleon wasn't actually that short. Right, but they still call that complex that that's still the name of it. Oh, like how if something is a scandal, it's always a gate. Even though the right. Watergate scandal was not about water. Gold to cat gate. In a way, Garrick is more imposing physically than the cat. Yeah, those wide shoulders and uh, stiff posture. His eyes as well. He stares right into your soul. He's kind of interesting as well. He didn't really do a lot in this episode. He just prodded Bashir very gently. But very skillfully. Yeah, well, Bashir is starstruck. Um, it was good when he comes onto Ops and just starts talking to Gull the Cat and Cisco looks at him like, what the... Oh, I love that look he gives him after he <laughs> steps on his toes. He just looks right and like, oh my... God. Makes you squirm a bit and actually worry about what will happen to Bashir. Yeah, Garrick has him under his thumb. I thought it was quite surprising at the end that Rugal went back with Padar, the Cardassian diplomat. Yeah, especially when it's Cisco as the arbiter. I wouldn't guess he would go that way yeah i could see if they deferred to a cardassian judge for some reason um maybe they had jurisdiction but it was up to cisco so he made that decision and that's weird yeah i think by the end of it i was actually quite invested in the child's story Uh, at the start it was a bit kind of incidental but towards the end I was interested, and I wanted to see how it turned out, and I was glad that they did address it, as in previous episodes, they have just dropped stuff. But I was also confused. I kind of couldn't connect that up to what had happened previously. It was not a logical conclusion, given what we saw. Yeah, but I guess guess they just dropped the actually important bit of the plot. So telling us that the child goes back with the Cardassian father is... (laughs) <laughs> academic at that point because you don't know why I can't see Cisco saying oh I don't care about the life you've led for the past eight years I'm going to rip you from the life you know 
and transplant uh, your life. Bye. It's just well, an odd resolution. Yeah, I guess he was living in an environment where everyone looked on him with disdain. But that's not necessarily enough to separate him from his uh, parents. Right. So they gave us a resolution, but didn't explain it. It's kind of an incomplete resolution, but I guess it's better than not addressing it at all. Yeah, they're learning. There was a, a lot of good lines from Garrick in this episode, I felt. Oh, so many, so many. Do any come to mind? I liked his final lines about the crumbs of something, the crumbs of a bagel, spell out my name in hidden stars. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. I liked it when he was talking about how the Cardassians, as they have taught so many races, how to keep records eff uh, effectively. It's so weird how kind of humble yet unashamed he is. Yeah, he has that odd mix, and that it works for, for his character. It's really good. Yeah, I mean, he's obviously not a simple tailor. He's off fixing computers and hacking systems. Or is he just a simple tailor? He's a simple tailor with some hobbies. He's a smart guy, at least. That much, we can say, with certainty. Although he cuts the pants too long, according to O'Brien the racist yeah that's probably just his stupid racism getting in the way yeah tainting his judgments of plain old simple garrick his judgments of appropriate pant length his, his vision is clouded with racism he can't even put on a pair of trousers without fuming pant length uh, judgments are the first to be affected by racism uh, so I've heard. I felt the guest stars again were good. I I should probably stop bringing that up. <laughs> I know it happens every single time, but it's true, and uh, I want to continue to give credit to the casting director and whoever is making those decisions. Um, they work out really well in this show. Yeah, it's good. It means if they have a bit part character, they're not going to stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, well, like, yeah, occasionally you get one or two that are a bit rubbish, but pretty much, by the by, every random character who turns up is interesting and believable just because of the strength of the random actors that they, they use. So, yeah, w well done, Star Trek. Keep it up. That's one thing I'm glad carried over from season one. Please continue having wonderful guest stars. I have a criticism. Oh, yes, go. So they interrogate that uh, record keeper, and she remembers an entry she made eight years ago with startling detail. Well, she remembers it because he was brought by a Cardassian officer. Even then, eight years is a long time. Maybe Bajorans have incredible recall. Uh, I doubt it. I mean, I could believe it for Cardassians, but Bajorans don't strike me as particularly different from humans. Anyway, I, I, you could imagine... If you got visited by the Gestapo, you wouldn't forget that, ever. Yeah. Her life wasn't endangered. Maybe she thought it was. So that would... Heighten the emotions and make it more likely that she remembered it. I, get, well, I guess that's fair. If you're on the bus and the Gestapo, a Gestapo officer sat next to you on the bus in Nazi Germany, you'd remember it. <laughs> what if it happened every day? Uh, then that well, becomes your new normal. <laughs> then the orphanage would be absolutely full of orphans. We saw a handful when they visited. Yeah, but if... They'd be getting one a day for eight years. That would be... A lot. 2,922, assuming there's 365 and a quarter days per year on Bajor, which there definitely 
isn't likely to be. Plus, they wouldn't visit on Bajoran holidays. <laughs> Are you saying they wouldn't drop off orphans at Christmas? Yes. Or New Year? No, one a day, every day. Here's they your daily orphan. <laughs> your daily orphan? As promised, here's your daily orphan. I think she would probably remember it, because... It, I, I don't know. I accept your criticism. But I, I don't think it's particularly serious. No, not really. It's just... Knowing the limitations and fallibility of human memory, it really stuck out to me. But... Having said that, people often have conviction that their memory is correct, um, even when it's wildly inaccurate. So that could have been happening as well. Strange the cat didn't really contest it at all. Well, I guess it was true, so he decided just to storm out crying. Maybe to go get some lifts. Some lifts? Yeah, for his shoes. <laughs> like Tom Cruise wears, I'm sure. But Tom Cruise just wore high heels. That is unsubstantiated. <laughs> uh, when Keiko was making dinner for Miles and Rugal, she continued something she's done previously in Next Gen of making wildly inappropriate food choices. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so she's got... Two people that despise Cardassia and everything Cardassian, and she just feeds them Cardassian blue soup. Which is weird, because they're human, and he hasn't had human food before. <laughs> so she could have just chosen like a pie or something. And it was kind of offensive how they kept talking about his homeworld of Cardassia. Who is they? Uh, Miles and Keiko. Oh, okay. Yeah, as if he's... Um, Ever well, been there? Yeah, as if he's a representative. Well, does Keiko know the context of his arrival? I would hope so. Maybe Rugal just showed up playing his space Game Boy, and she didn't question him. Okay. Here's a nice young boy from Cardassia. It's from Bajor, though. I know, but I'm saying she would think that he's oh, from right, Cardassia yeah. if she didn't question him. So she's just... his Bajoran earring. Inviting random Cardassians in, knowing that her husband has likely got post-traumatic stress disorder about his extended time fighting Cardassians in a war. Exactly. Well, she wants to be perceived as... Accepting Insane. and <laughs> accepting and progressive. She made that school and accepts everyone. Oh, lovely Keiko. You're so nuts, but not really. So do you have a selected quote? I do, and it was really hard to, to settle on one because Garrick had so many great lines. Well then, I hope you did. Because otherwise this podcast is ruined. Fret not, I have a quote. Oh, phew. There are always games, Doctor. And I really like that quote because whenever two people interact, they both have agendas. Everyone has an agenda. They want things done that aren't expressed and things that are expressed. And... I like that that line came out of Garrick's mouth. Yeah, people are always serving their interests to some degree. And that was largely what this episode was about, so I thought it was a nice little summary, I guess. You didn't choose the one about the crumbs of donuts line up to spell the truth of the matter of my everything? Well, that one uh, emphasizes the perception and what people perceive isn't always what you want to convey. And I wanted to go with the quote more about how what you perceive isn't always correct. In the beginning, 
uh, Goldicott comes off as this altruistic Cardassian. I mean, we know better because he's an evil guy. Oh, I want to save the orphans. This is a terrible thing that I need to fix. But he had ulterior motives. So that's why I went with the uh, There Are Always Games, Doctor. Yeah, it's a good quote. About his last quote, do you actually think it was clear if you connect the dots what Garrick's motive and relation with Goldica is? Nope. Yeah, I didn't think so either. He's just lying <laughs> when he says that. Yeah, it's just uh, smoke and mirrors and crumbs. Crumbs and tables. Crummy smoke and mirrors. Oh, you could have gone with cloak and dagger, because cloak sees a tailor. Ooh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, to continue the tailor puns, maybe we should cut this short. <laughs> yes, let's uh, cut it short. All right. Bye.